All right, in the last lecture, uh, we had talked about the refrigeration cycle and how the goal is to do work. So right here, and I didn't, I didn't write this in, and I probably should have. We're doing a lot of work here. Okay, work is being done to the gas to heat it up so that heat will leave into the lower temperature of the room. And then you allow the gas to do work here. So this is another place where work is being done. But in this case, it's work being done by the gas or by the liquid and that cools it down to the point where it's cooler than the inside of your refrigerator and now heat will go from the refrigerator into these coils warming them up to the point where you can compress them to get them to really high temperature and so on and we did sort of a brief example problem over here um, another thing that we can do is make this a little bit neater I'm going to use some different numbers just to make it super easy Let's do a case where instead of it being, um, let's say we have a high temperature of 300 Kelvin and a low temperature of 270 Kelvin. And I chose these because it's going to then be very simple or actually not quite as simple as I wanted it to be. Let's make this 250 Kelvin. So it's really cold. This is a really, really low freezer. Uh, we want things really, really cold. And so what you'll notice, first of all, is that the coefficient of performance ideally is going to be higher than it was before. So we'll have TL over TH minus TL and we wind up then with 250 over 50 or um, well actually it's, it's not so good because we have a, a great difference here uh, we have 5 as our ideal case and the reason why this is lower and I, I was thinking about it backwards the reason why our ideal is lower is because we have a greater gap to cover okay so we're not going to be able to do this nearly as efficiently or effectively as we might like. And that actually brings up an interesting point. If your temperature, if you, the temperature you want the, the refrigerator to be, so say your low temperature is the same as the high temperature, so you want the inside of your refrigerator to be the same temperature of the room, your ideal coefficient of performance is infinity because you divide by zero. That makes sense. You shouldn't need to do any work to leave the door of your refrigerator open and uh, unplug it, which is essentially what we'd be doing if we did this. Uh, now what we're going to do really this time though is uh, look at a case where I give you a ratio between the coefficient of performance and the ideal coefficient of performance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the ideal coefficient, of the actual coefficient of performance is equal to um, let's make it easy once again, 50% of the ideal. And so you can easily then just get that the actual coefficient of performance is 2.5. This is very low. This is not a good return uh, on our investment. It's still better than nothing, but it's, it's, it's not very energy efficient. And so what we can do then is we can see, okay, so how much power how much power do we need to supply at the compressor? Because this is where we're doing work. How much power must we apply if we want to remove, let's say, 20 joules? And let's go a little bit bigger. Let's say, now let's go 20 joules per second. Um, when it's working, it's actually it's going to be much higher power than this. But if we just do an average of the total and, and get the average power, you know what? Never mind. You you probably noticed your refrigerator doesn't run all the time, but when it does run, it really runs. It really exerts a lot of um, of power. So what I'll do here is I'll say, let's, let's say that we're removing, when the refrigerator is actually running, we're removing 200 joules, okay? 
and we do this every second while it's running. So how much power do we need? So when you look at this, you have a coefficient of performance of 2.5, and we know that the coefficient of performance is the same as QL over work. And so we can rearrange this and say, well, the work that we have to do to remove 200 joules is equal to 200 divided by 2.5, which is the same as um, 200 times uh, 2 divided by 5, so 400 divided by 5, I think that's about 80 joules. And because we did this every second, the power output that we need is 80 watts. This is not that intense, this is actually a pretty uh, low power output for a refrigerator when it's, when it's running um, at capacity. But that's how you would do a problem like this, where I give you some temperatures, I give you a relationship between the coefficient of performance and the ideal, and then ask you to find out something like the power output given the heat that you need to remove every second. And the last thing that I'm going to say is that we could also find how much heat needs to be outputted to the outside environment. And you can do that in a couple different ways. They have to add up. The work that you put in, the energy you put in through compression, plus the energy that you put in through removing heat from the inside of the refrigerator, have to add up to the amount of energy you output. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a complete cycle. This would just get hotter and hotter and hotter if these two didn't add up to be this one. And so all that we would have to do in this case is add those two together. We'd get 280 joules is how much energy we would need to output into the outside environment, which is acting like a heat sink, by the way. Your, your room is acting like a heat sink. Um, so we're just outputting this much energy in that case. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is look a little bit at heat pumps, and then we'll be done. So a heat pump functions in exactly the same way that a refrigerator does, just in reverse. So to give you an idea of this, this was the inside of your refrigerator, or if we're talking about an air conditioner, this is the inside of your home. This was the outside of your refrigerator, outside of the system we're trying to cool down, or the outside of your home. Um, a heat pump just reverses it. It says this is the inside of your home, the part that we want to heat up, and this cold area, this is the outside. So this uh, gas that's going through here has to be colder than the outside temperature. And this here, this liquid here, has to be warmer than the inside temperature. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to warm up um, your room, and this won't be able to effectively cool it down. Which brings up some problems with heat pumps. If you live in an area where it gets really cold outside, then you might not have a heat pump that's effectively able to compress the air enough and to evaporate it enough to get a colder temperature than the outside, which is why in really cold temperatures, if you go up north even a little bit more than we are, you don't see heat pumps very often. They might be kind of a, a supplemental thing for the, the more moderate months, but in the deep of winter, you do not want a heat pump if it's going to get really cold outside. It'll freeze up. Um, it won't flow effectively through here. You won't be able to warm up. You won't be able to actually cool down these coils. Or I'm sorry, you won't be able to heat up these coils enough to then heat up the inside of your home. Um, and one of the things that is interesting is you really are using the energy that's still present in that cold outside air. You're using that energy to supplement the work that you're doing. Okay, so you take energy in here, you use that to supplement the work that you're doing so that you can give off more heat inside. If you just did work on your own, if you just burned electricity, it wouldn't be nearly as efficient as using the energy already present in that outside air. So that's why people use heat pumps. The downside is, is that because they can freeze, if it's too cold outside, they can actually freeze this stuff or freeze some of the, uh, the other moving parts, that it's not effective at all. You'd be better off with an electrical heater or something like a gas uh, heater or wood. You can always burn wood. So the coefficient of performance, because the intent of the heat pump is exactly the opposite of the intent 
of a refrigerator. The equation is exactly the opposite. You're looking to see how much heat can you put into the high temperature region compared to how much work you had to do to get there. Um, and there's really not a whole lot to it. Uh, so I'll just give you a brief uh, example of that. One of the nice things about the heat pumps is that because they are the same as the refrigerators, just in reverse, we can, we can still use the same images. So let's say that uh, we have an inside temperature, and we'll do kind of the opposite, of 300 Kelvin, and we have an outside temperature, I got ahead of myself there, we have an outside temperature of 250 Kelvin. Wow, that's really cold. So this is this is super super cold since zero Celsius is, or 273 Kelvin is zero Celsius. So this is super super cold. Um, probably your heat pump's not going to work. But those are your temperatures, and your ideal coefficient of performance would then be because your your CP is QH over work, the ideal coefficient of performance would be TH minus, I'm sorry, TH divided by TH minus TL, and that is an H. And so we have here 300 divided by 50, or 6 would be our coefficient of performance for the heat pump. And then if we go down here, we could do a similar thing where we could do a ratio. Uh, or I could just say, let's take a look at, at what we have here. The coefficient of performance is maybe half of the ideal. So 3. And what we need to do is we, or I guess what I could say is, we can do 1,000 joules of work. That's what we've got. So then we can go down here to this equation, coefficient of performance times work equals the heat that we're inputting into the high temperature region. And that would then, in this case, give us 3,000 joules, which isn't a bad deal. You know, if you just were using electrical heater, you would get 1,000 joules of heat out. If you're using 10 100 watt light bulbs, you would get almost 100 or 1,000 joules of heat out. Uh, so using 1,000 joules of electricity to get 3,000 joules of heat is actually quite nice. It's just that in temperatures this cold, it's probably not going to be very effective. And the last thing we'll look at just briefly are air conditioners. They're the same as refrigerators, so I'm not going to spend much time on them. Uh, often heat pumps can just be reversed to be air conditioners because the parts that you want inside um, you just want to be outside then the next time around. So you can just reverse the process. It's a little bit more work in terms of constructing it, but it's the same idea. So you can just reverse it. Um, these air conditioners, much like heat pumps, they're especially useful in areas that have mild winters and mild summers because they work most effectively when the temperatures are identical. So if you have mild summers where the outside temperature is, is 70 degrees, and you want the inside of your home to be 70 degrees, then you don't need an air conditioner. Now that's accepting things like the radiation energy that you might get from the sun. So you might still want a little bit of a temp or of an air conditioner. But basically, because you're going to be operating so close to the outside temperature, you're not going to need to do much work. So it's going to be very efficient. And the same thing's true if you have mild winters. If you want to keep, if it only gets down to 60 degrees, or let's say 50 degrees outside, and you want your home to be 65 degrees, well, that's a pretty close temperature difference. We're talking Fahrenheit here, not, not Kelvin. Um, but if you, you want your home to be 75 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer, or in the winter, and the normal temperature outside is about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, your heat pump is not going to be nearly as effective as it would be if you lived in a milder region. And I believe that's it for both air conditioners, heat pumps, and also the refrigeration system cycle as a whole.